my father's word. Chapter 24, the great book of Ezekiel, El is strong, or God strengthens you. Now, we're going to have a series here from about this chapter 24 through about 32 that is a parable spoken by God concerning the Babylonian war. What does that have to do with you? Well, the king of Babylon is coming in the book of Revelation, and as Paul would reiterate in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, these things happened as an example whereby you would know what would befall us at the end of the world. So he's even going to go into groups of people. That's important. But I think probably the main thing you should pick up on is God's emotions. I think it's good for you to understand our Father's emotions because you certainly want to please him. And telling, you lo you, telling him you love him is one thing, but knowing what to do is extra, and it brings extra gifts. Don't ever forget it. Let's just roll with it. Let's make some time. We got about from here through 32 in a great parable of, as well as other teachings. Let's go with it. Chapter 24, a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name. Verse 1 of chapter 24, and it reads, Again, in the ninth year, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, we're along in the captivity a little bit of those to the north, to son of man, write thee the name of the day. In other words, you mark this day. Even of this same day, the king of Babylon set himself against Jerusalem this same day. And I'm going to tell you something about this day today. The king of Babylon, has God has already marked the day that he's going to be cast from heaven as the spurious Messiah. You better be ready. Are you? I don't know. Verse 3. That's what this is for, to prepare you. Verse 3. And utter a parable unto the rebellious house, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, set on a pot, set it on, and also pour, also pour water into it. Now, I, I want you to remember the scoffers back in chapter 11, verses 1 through about 12. Jeremiah was warning them that, um, that uh, they were going into captivity, and then, oh, no, 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 no. Jerusalem is a pot, and we're the flesh in it. God's turning this analogy around on them got a little different connotation than the safety they claimed they had by it. Parables are something not everyone will understand, but take as much as you can from it and never be, a, be concerned to study it again. You'll gain more each time. Verse 4, gather the pieces thereof into it, even every good piece, the thigh and the shoulder, fill it with the choice bones. Don't fill it with mutton. This is from sheep, meaning his own people. I kind of like it here in a way. You know, usually the good pieces were that that was sacrificed. He kind of said here, I don't want it. So that kind of lets you know the frame of mind. He said, even those put in it. Verse 5. Take the choice of the flock and burn also the bones. I, this should be translated wood. I think the Masa locks it in where I'm going to say it should read also the wood under it and make it boil well and let them see the bones of it therein you cook them up good okay now uh, again this is a little contrary to what verse chapter 11 had to say when they scoffed and said Jerusalem's a pot and we're in it we're safe well not according to God's standard verse 6 Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city, to the pot whose scum is therein, and whose scum is not gone out of it. Bring it out piece by piece. Let no lot fall upon it. Now, there is a much deeper uh, lesson within this. The word scum here is a Greek word. The, to Englishize it, it would be verdigus. And, uh, well, let's, let's do it a little further. False verdigus would be 
tarnish, what we call tarnish. You know how copper and silver or other silver turns darker, but copper and turns green? So, uh, and um, the real thing is where you, real uh, verdigas is where you mix acetone with one of these metals, and it's poison. And scum is kind of poison, in other words. Now, I'm not saying tarnish is poison. I don't want you to worry anyone about your children, but, but yet there is a point within this that you must grasp. He said, put the choice pieces in as well as everything else. But hey, you know, we're told that our deeds are going to be tested by fire, and all of us try to have at least copper, silver, and if you're really fortunate and you're really working hard, it's gold, and it's going to be tested by fire. What, what I gather from this, he's saying a little bit, some of you that even think you're doing real good, has got, you've got a lot of tarnish on you. And it's going off. We're going we're gonna to boil you till even the tarnish leaves the good people. Now, this, I feel, comes totally and completely to the apostasy. Because those that claim to be good, I will, I will liken this to the ten virgins. Yeah, that's a good round number, but only five of them made it. Five missed the boat. There are many that are going to fall into the clutches of this king of Babylon, which is to say the false Christ. They might be good old silver-toting people. By that I mean their deeds work for the church all their life. But if you've listened to traditions of men rather than God, you're in a heap of hurt. So this parable has a, a much deeper meaning. And I don't want to say a great deal about the actual... Um, uh, verdigris because it is poison and I and in as much as I have used tarnish well I, I choose to go no further with it in other words I, again I want to reiterate tarnish is not poison that forms on silver and copper but it is called false uh, verdigris all right and if you take it to what the actual word is from the Greek um, God goes a little further. It's poison for some. And I'm not talking about tarnish again, okay? I apologize for that. Verse 7. For her blood is in the midst of her. She set it upon the top of a rock. She poured it not upon the ground to cover it with dust. It is a common thing that when you are um, butchering uh, family livestock, you always bury the blood, and when the herd comes and they smell that, they go bananas, okay, if you don't cover it. He said, you don't even cover the blood of your murder. And I, I must tell you again, her greatest gift, her greatest sin in this city, though it was part of God's word in fulfillment, there was a rock that blood was left on top of. That rock is called Golgotha, or skull being interpreted. And Christ's blood was on top of that rock, and it was left there. And it is that same blood that cleanses us. Uh, his body took the stripes, and we gain the healing. But that is the place where it transpired. There's many spiritual murders which are far worse than flesh murders, quite frankly. Be careful, friend. Verse 8, that it might cause fury to come up to take vengeance uh, I have set her blood upon the top of a rock that it should not be covered. That's the blood of Christ on the top of Golgotha. It's there. It's not going to go away. It is Messiah. Verse 9, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city. That's Jerusalem, of course. I will even make the pile of fire great. 10, Heap on wood, kindle the fire, consume the flesh, and spice it well, and let the bones be burned. You boil it not until the meat falls off the bones, but until the bones themselves are gone. 11. Then set it empty upon the coals thereof. You take that old pot, pour, pour it out, and set it empty, even upside down if you would, thereof, that the brass of it may be hot and may burn, and that the filthiness 
of it may be molten in it, that the scum of it, that's the tarnish of it, may be consumed. Pop the rust off of it. Cleanse it. Fire is very cleansing, and God is a consuming fire. Now, this is all spiritual, but the parable is so that you can get the picture. The scoffers, the mockers, back in the 11th chapter, said, this is what we want to be. We're not going to do what God wants us to be. We want to be in that pot. And, of course, they were looking at it as an iron pot that nobody could come through to get them. That's what Jerusalem was. God's saying quite the contrary. You put the best you've got in there, and they're still tarnished. Uh, quite frankly, I don't know of any of us that maybe not doesn't have a little tarnish on our gold. Okay? Better be careful, friend. Verse 12. She hath wearied herself with lies, and her great scum, tarnish, went not forth out of her. Her scum shall be in the fire. That tarnish is going to be there. It still remains. The stench of it, he says. Even after it's burned, the stench is there. God's not going to forget about it real soon. I don't know. How often do you repent? 13. In thy filthiness is lewdness, because I have purged thee, and thou wast not purged. Thou shalt not be purged from thy filthiness any more, till I have caused my fury to rest upon thee. Um, so, that, which when does that take place? When his great wrath pours out at the very end? Okay, that's the time that we're looking forward to. It's when Almighty God sends, return, has the return of the Son, second advent. And I don't know, what kind of shape are you going to be in? How long, how long has it been since you checked for tarnish on your silver, gold, copper? We won't even worry about it. If your deeds only amount to straw and wood, it don't matter whether it's tarnished or not. Tarnish really won't grow on those because you've never done anything, not fit for nothing and no good anyway. Okay? Not even worth the test. Verse 14. I, the Lord, have spoken it. It shall, not maybe, not perhaps, it shall come to pass, and I will do it. I will not go back. I'm not, neither will I spare, neither will I repent. I'm not changing my mind. According to thy ways and according to thy doing shall, thy, shall they judge thee, saith the Lord God. So what, what, what better way to say, you're going to get everything you got coming to you. Now, this is why it's important that you do love your father and repent, and you're not in this kettle of fish, okay, or of mutton. There's no need in you being there. This, this would cause many people to fear. And I'm going to tell you something. It is true that there's, not, there's none of us perfect. And all of us do get a little tarnished, but on repentance, because of that blood on the rock, which is to say Christ, Messiah, then that tarnish is popped away and peeled away, and you're as glistening in the sun as a new piece of gold, silver, or copper, or brass. It's a cleansing. God will purge. If, you're, if you are, Christ would say, I am the vine, you are the branch, and God is the pruner. He'll prune you when you need it, and that's good. Always thank him for it. You needed it. But what he's saying here is keep yourself in a good stead because you're going to get everything you've got coming to you, and if it's rewards, fantastic. You get all of your rewards at one time. How perfect could it be? At the same time, if you've got a lot of tarnish, you get all your pain, all your punishment at one time. And he said, I'm not changing my mind at the end. Verse 15. Also, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, 16, Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. Yet neither shall thou mourn nor weep, neither shall thy tears run down. In other words, I'm going to... this. This is an analogy. Ezekiel will be used as an analogy. And God says, I'm going to take your lovely wife away from you. She's going to die of a stroke, a CVA. It's going to happen. 17. Forbear to cry. 
make no mourning for the dead. Don't you, don't you shed a tear over your wife. Bind the tire on thine head upon thee. In other words, I don't want you to put on sackcloth. I want you to put on the best hat you've got. And put on thy shoes upon thy feet and cover not thy lips. In other words, many people, when you lose someone, you got a long lip. Why? You, you, you love them. You miss them. He said, keep your lip taut. And eat not the bread of men. This means the, the bread of sorrow. That is to say, it's customary even to this time, basically, in many places, that when one loses a loved one, people bring food in. 18. So I, he said, don't eat it. You're any, this is an example I'm setting forth to the people. 18. So I spake unto the people in the morning, and at even my wife died, and I did in the morning as I was commanded. Ezekiel always followed God's lead, 19. And the people said unto me, Wilt thou not tell us what these things are to us, that thou doest so? What does all this mean? Verse 20. And then I answered them, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, 21, Speak unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the excellency of your strength. Where is your strength? God's house. That's God's sanctuary. The desire of your eyes, and that which your soul pitieth, loves, better translated, and your sons and your daughters whom you have left shall fall by the sword, by false word, by, fault, by lies, deception, false teachings. God, in a sense, lost the majority of his virgin bride at the second advent. He knows he's going to. He knows that all the world will whore after the beast that are not well informed in God's word. Do you think he's going to cry about it? He's not going to feel good. Verse 22. Understand, this is a parable. 22. And ye shall do as I have done. Ye shall not cover your lips, nor eat the bread of men. The sin, you're not, don't pay any attention to the sympathy of friends. 23. And your tires, your hat, shall be upon your head. The very best you've got. And your shoes upon your feet. The best you've got. Ye shall not mourn nor weep, but ye shall pine away for your iniquities, your sins, and mourn one toward another. Who? The first fruits. I guess maybe you could apply a little tarnish to that, my friend. I don't care if you call yourself one of God's elect. Anybody ever popped a little rust off of you, friend? Think about it. 24. Thus Ezekiel is upon you a sign, is unto you rather a sign. According to all that he hath done, so ye do. And when this cometh, ye shall know that I am the Lord God. It's going to happen. Verse 25. Also, thou son of man, shall it not be in the day when I take from them their strength? Kind of the opposite of Ezekiel, God is my strength. He's going to take it the other way, okay? The joy of their glory, the desire of their eyes, and that, uh, and that whereupon they set their minds, their sons and their daughters. Quite a loss, friend. Think about it. 26. That he that escapeth in that day shall come unto thee to cause thee to hear it with thine ears. Chapter 33, verse um, uh, 21 on down to... 3322, part of the acrostics of 11, a different subject for a different time. We'll explain that in more depth. Do you know who escaped? Christ was crucified on that rock, but he didn't die. Think about it. 27, in that day shall thy mouth be open to him, <clears throat> excuse me, which is escaped. And thou shalt speak and be no more dumb. You're going to know and understand the parable. You're going to know and understand God's word, and you're going to teach it. And thou shalt be a sign unto them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Jesus would say in Matthew chapter, Mark rather, chapter 13, 
in the word, behold, I have foretold you all things. Do you understand that? You don't need some wizard. Christ said, I have foretold you all things in this word. All you need to know. You don't need to go out shaking bushes and listening to wizards or nuts or fruitcakes or people making and dreaming up stuff. That'll pull you away from the word. Behold, I have foretold you all things. And why did God say his children were destroyed? For lack of what? Lack of sleep? Lack of money? No, lack of knowledge. Absorb his letter and understand. <clears throat> you know, there is a deeper message in this for the poor me baby. And you'd better pay attention. Anytime you think you've had a great loss, you better think about your father's emotions at what kind of loss he has suffered. And you'd better be a little understanding. God doesn't just come out and tell us how he feels about his loss. But a wise person knows and understands. As he would plead, in a sense, in the second book of Peter, chapter 3, eh, verse uh, 8 or 9, he said, Hey, I am long-suffering. He's got all kinds of patience. And it is his will, it's his hope, that all come to repentance so they can be saved as children. But I assure you, he's going to lose many. And he loves them. He doesn't get any pleasure from seeing people go to hell. Think about his loss. Try to get out of your little old shell of your little innocent life, necessarily. And think about the greatness of our Father and his loss. But don't don't lose focus of what he teaches you personally about your tarnish either, okay? Tw chapter 25, verse 1. <clears throat> the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, To son of man, set thy face against the Ammonites and prophesy against them. Now he's going into peoples and types. Where do you fit? All right, well, I don't know. Don't <clears throat> perhaps uh, figure it, try to figure it down to the nitty-gritty, but some of you will, and that's all the better. Who was Ammon? Ammon was the youngest son of Lot by his youngest daughter, I believe it was. Verse 3, And say unto the Ammonites, Hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God, Because thou sayest, Aha! Against my sanctuary when it was profaned, and against the land of Israel when it was desolate, and against the house of Judah when they went into captivity. You didn't lift a hand to help. God said, I don't like that. They were my children, and you're my children, but they are kin, Ben, sons, cousins. This was Lot's, this was Abraham's nephew's son. You should have helped your own kinfolk. He doesn't like it. You should stick together. Verse 4. Behold, therefore, I will deliver thee to the men of the east for a possession, and they shall set their uh, palaces in thee. They're going to set their headquarters right up there and make <clears throat> their dwellings in thee. They shall eat thy fruit, and they shall drink thy milk. Five, and I will make rabbah. This means plenteous, fruitful. <clears throat> a stable for camels. Do you know what a stable of camels is full of? Dung, camel dung, okay? So that's where you're going. And the Ammonites, a couching place for flocks. And you shall know that I am the Lord, a place where sheep graze. That's all it's going to, you're going to be finished, done, over, sick, as far as a nation is concerned, okay? Singularly and individually, no problem if you listen, sick. For thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast clapped thine hands and stamped with thy the feet and rejoiced in heart, right in your very soul, nephesh, with all the with all thy despite against the land of Israel, you mocked, made fun, did not help, but
But if anything were against the children through which Messiah, my son, would come. Seven. Behold, therefore, I will stretch out mine hand upon thee and will deliver thee for a spoil, meat in the pot, friend, to the heathen, the nations. And I will cut thee off from the people, and I will cause thee to perish out of the countries. I will destroy thee, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, and they are. There's no nation known by that name today. Okay. Why, don't, don't you see a little bit? I mean, think, uh, think of this from the father's aspect, okay? He had children in dire straits that had relatives right there that had really looked out. Abraham looked out for a lot. Let him have the choice land that he chose. And yeah, he got mixed up with some bad company and so forth, but that doesn't excuse the fact that his sons were blessed by God, whereby they became a pretty good nation and could have helped God's children through which Messiah would come. They refused. If anything, they added to it. You can see, God doesn't forget things like that. I suppose what that uh, boils down to is the fact that he doesn't like anybody that doesn't help his son. Because if you're not helping his son, what was his son's name again? Emmanuel, God with us. Then you're not helping God either. I don't know. How are you doing, friend? Does God bless you? I don't know. You decide. Verse 8. Thus saith the Lord God, because that Moab, this would be Ammon's brother of his own father is what it means. Because of Moab and Seir do say, because uh, that Moab and Seir do say, Behold, the house of Judah is like unto all the heathen. Whoa. That was the king line, okay? I mean, them are kin folks. Nine. Therefore, behold, I will open the side of Moab from the cities, from his cities which are on his frontiers, the glory of the country. Bergestamoth, Beth, Beth, Jesamoth, Beermion, and Kerai Athiam. Okay, let's translate rather than transliterate. It's important. Of course, Beth is house. You know that. Jeshemoth is the uh, house of the desert. And Baal Meon is um, the habitation of the Baal priest, okay? And Kurathion is to say uh, double floor or double minded. Can't make their mind up. Listen to this and decide and listen to somebody else and, oh, well, that's got to be right. Never quite get straight down the middle of God's truth. Verse 10. Unto the men of the east with the Ammonites, and will give them in possession that the Ammonites may not be remembered among the nations. Gone forever. What about the Moabites? 11. And I will execute judgment upon Moab, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Now, it's important that you know this. This was against the men who did not fight to help. Ruth was a Moabitess of the people. And many think that she was, uh, had a uh, hex placed upon her here by God, a, a curse or whatever you wish. No, not so. The men, males. Just another little subject for a different time. Verse 12, Thus saith the Lord God, because of Edom. Edom is Esau, okay? It means red hath dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance and hath greatly offended and revenged himself upon them. Hey, they were brothers, okay? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will also stretch out mine hand upon Edom and will cut off man and beast from it and I will make it desolate from Teman. Uh, this was the region of Esau's grandson. And they of Dedan, meaning the low country, uh, a place of commerce, and shall, uh, shall fall by the sword. 14. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel. And they shall do in Edom according to mine anger and according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance, saith the Lord God. Let me tell you something. 
the land of Edom, as you're going to learn in the 38th and the 39th chapter when this final takes place, and you're going to find out what our people did. What, um, as it would say here, and I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel. Edom turned to communism. This is Rush, the chief prince, Meshech. In the Hebrew tongue is Rosh, later by the Volga Rush, and today Russia. The government doesn't have anything to do with the people, Russian people. They're heroes when it comes to Christianity. That is to say, those that cut holes and eyes to baptize their people. Okay. But in the war of Korea in Vietnam, we broke the back of Edom. They've even had to change their politics. But don't worry, as you'll learn in 37 and 38, they'll be back. So this verse 14 is a lot more timely than you might think. Verse 15. Thus saith the Lord, I want you to know God didn't say he was going to do it. He said, my people are going to do it. Those ten tribes of the house of Israel that went north over the Caucasus Mountains, called Caucasian, settled Europe, migrating to Canada and America. They did it. The Christian nations called the United Nations. 15, thus saith the Lord God, because the Philistines have dealt by revenge and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy it for the old hatred from before, the migratory ones. A lot of Kenites mixed in there. And um, uh, they like to, migratory means to roll or wallow in the dust, all right? And uh, who is it that's uh, cursed to be on the dust, the belly of the rest of his life? You're beginning to get pretty close, 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will stretch out mine hand. He says, I'm going to do it this time. Upon the Philistines, I will cut off the uh, Koreatums. And uh, you know that is almost unreadable for my cherethems. cherethems. Uh, my Bible is getting so old, I can't even make that out. But I know that's what it is. It means in the Hebrew tongue, the executioners, okay? the um, uh, Sherathens, and destroy the remnant of the seacoast. Going to do it. 17, and I will execute great vengeance. This is your father speaking. I will execute great vengeance upon them with furious rebukes, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I shall lay my vengeance upon them. Now, there, there's something I think that I wanted, like I said, I wanted you to really pay strict attention and adhere to the emotions of God. Why is he so furious? Because they're picking on his children. You got it? They're making it very difficult on those of any one of those people, the Moabites, the, uh, the uh, Ammonites, um, the Philistines, anyone that would want to, whomsoever will, love the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood that was on the rock. In other words, he's furious because of the way they did his children and treated his sanctuary, which was a place to teach all. Because how many of them are his children? All of them. All of them. But roles are to be paid. Pay strict attention to the parable. Do not lose touch with the emotions of your father why he's doing this because then you would miss his love which documents that you have not one iota to fear because he does it all for you in the first place. And he certainly has the ability to protect his own. Again, like he said, you're going to get everything you got coming to you all at once. I don't know, how are you doing? If you've been serving him, that means a bunch of love and gifts for your work. And if you're bad, then you're bad. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?